and then I'll just put this up on YouTube so you've got it. So hello year 11 if you're watching this. And then um, when you get home tonight, if you do want to go over this again, right, you can just look through it again. Okay? Uh, so, in the medieval period, if we're thinking about three good groups of migrants that are easy to remember, and there's lots you can write about them, the first and most obvious one I would talk about are Jewish migrants. Jewish migrants arrive in roughly... So we'll use that circa again. Remember, C means circa. It's a Latin word. It means roughly circa 11, uh, 1070, sorry, is when they're arriving. Because, of course, they are first invited by William I or William the Conqueror, William of Normandy, whatever you want to call him. And they're invited by William I to loan him money primarily because William wants to build lots of castles across England and they are expensive, so he needs the wealth of, of Jewish, wealthy Jewish um, moneylenders because Christian law at, the, at that time, Christian law prohibits or bans um, Christians from committing usury. Usury, just in kind of simple terms, means lending money. It actually means charging interest on, on lending money. So you, that's the way that banks make money from lending money. They charge interest. Christian law bans Christians from doing that in the early medieval period. So that's why, why William invites them over. And I suppose that's where... Uh, I did one this morning during the thing, but they'll all be in different because this is like a mix of all the three history groups. So they'll all be in. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, right. Sorry about that. Uh, and of course, that's where the original kind of. Uh, suppression of Jewish people comes from. There's this rumour that goes around, oh, all Jews are moneylenders. Of course, they're loaning money also to English nobles. Nobody likes having to pay money back, especially to someone that they see as not part of their country. They are Jewish, they are different, that's how they're seen. And the Christian nobles do not want to pay money back to the Jewish moneylenders, so they start to resent them. But also, that's where modern stereotypes around Jewish people have kind of begin. Um, with this kind of rumours that they're, they're all moneylenders, they're all kind of out to make a quick buck. No thanks, Mia, you don't need that right now. Um, all right, so this is where stereotypes develop as all Jews being moneylenders, right? So that leads to resentment. And then we get all sorts of different examples, don't we, of the bad treatment of Jewish people. So you might talk about um, the blood libel cases. So remember, that's where Jewish people are accused of murdering Christian children and draining their blood and baking it into bread for the Passover, for Passover festival. Um, of course, these are completely false and completely wrong but actually several thanks boys but actually several Jews in England are executed as part of blood libel cases um, with year 10 this year we've learned about a lady called Licoricia of Winchester you might listen have listened to that podcast that that Mr Bassett and I made about her her own husband um, I think Abraham he was called was I, I got in a blood libel case and ended up being executed as a result of it. So this, this really did happen to people. It's absolutely terrible. And then, of course, you've got um, kind of more... So this would be, I suppose, an unofficial response. So this is people accusing people of, of Jewish people of blood libel cases. And then you have more official responses. So there, there, are, there are the talages. 
These are special taxes charged on Jews only, so special Jewish taxes. Uh, and there are loads, really famous, uh, lots of really famous ones. Henry uh, Richard I is the first to do it in the 1180s, I think it's 1189, he charges a tallage around that. Um, Henry III charges several really huge tallages on the Jewish population of England. And Edward I charges the biggest, really, several tallages, special taxes on Jewish people. And we're talking like millions or even billions in today's money. They're really a bleeding the Jews of England dry. And of course, you might be asking, why can they do this? Well, if we go right back to the start, when they're invited by William, they actually officially become William's property. The Jews of England are the property of the English king, the English monarchy. And um, that's good in some ways for the Jews, because it means they can get protection if they're being attacked. Uh, Jews have the right to go to the king's castle and seek protection in there, because they are the king's belongings, weirdly. But it also causes problems from the right, because they can basically, the, the kings, the monarchs, can do what they want with them. For example, you might remember that in 1290, Jews are expelled by... Um, Edward I. I suppose the other really big um, thing that you might talk about are pogroms, attacks on Jews. Uh, there's a really famous one in 1190 at Clifford's Tower, which is in York, during Richard I's reign, where people attack the Jews in the tower, and the Jews in the tower sign a, a suicide pact and actually um, end up killing themselves inside the castle rather than face the mob outside. And then there are, um, there are lots of attacks, lots of pogroms. That's what an attack is, an attack on a particular group or a particular race or religion. There are other pogroms in the 1260s. In 1263 and 1264, there was a civil war all across England with Simon de Montfort, things like that. Um, there are several attacks led by Simon de Montfort and his men um, and their armies on Jewish people in towns. There are attacks on the Jewries where Jews live in London, in Lincoln, in Winchester. Again, if you've listened to that podcast, you will have heard about how Licoretia was there in Winchester when they were attacked by Simon de Montfort's son's men, also confusingly called Simon de Montfort. Um, so that's the Jews, and I, I would talk about them as one group in the medieval period. The other group that I think I would sort of probably focus on because they're easy to remember, and there's probably less to remember with them as well, which is nice, is Flemish migrants. Flemish migrants are first invited by Henry III in um, the 1270s, but he just invites Flemish weavers. Okay, that's really important because lots of Flemings, that means people from Flanders, Flemish people, lots of Flemings um, who aren't weavers come. And so one month later, um, he actually sends all non-weaving Flemish migrants home. Uh, then they are invited again in the 1330s, I think it's 1333 actually, but we'll write 1330s, by Edward III. And at this point he invites everybody. He invites Flemish weavers, he also invites um, Flemish brewers, people who brew beer, um, and lots of women actually were brewing beer. Um, lots of Flemish women, but he actually invites all Flemings to live in, in England, and actually they prosper, they do really well. There are lots of Flemish migrants who set up breweries, especially in Kent in the east of England. That makes Mr Jones very happy, because that meant English beer got a lot better. Um, but also, there are loads of Flemish migrants who set up weaving businesses, cloth dyeing businesses, and also start working as cloth merchants, buying and selling um, wool and cloth. They do really well in England because England has produces the best wool in Europe at this time. 
That's why the kings, Henry VIII and Edward III, are inviting them in the first place. They're kind of cutting out the middleman, right? Um, so they do really, really well in England. So they set up successful businesses. And generally, they're kind of well accepted, etc. Um, but of course, that sometimes leads to resentment. So famously, in 1381, in the Peasants' Revolt, um, Flemish migrants are attacked in London. Okay? And um, lots were murdered, actually, as well. Um, now, I'm, gonna, I'm conscious of time, so what I'm going to suggest is that I go through two for each one, and then if we've got time at the end, we'll, um, we'll go back through them, okay? Give me one second, I'm just checking this list of people, which is a very long list that Mr. Um, Davis just sent me, one sec. Uh, so, as I was saying, what I'm going to do, thanks, girls, thanks. What I'm going to do is go through two for each one, cause, just because I'm conscious of time, okay? Girls, can we stop? It's getting irritating now. Um, all right, so if I was thinking about early modern migrants, the obvious one to talk about is Huguenots. Huguenot migrants arrive after the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre. which is in 1573, I think, but I need to check. Bear with me. Girls, you asked for this, specifically. If you don't want my help, you know where the door is. Uh, it's in 1572, so I was a year out. Okay. So, Huguenots arrived after the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572. Why? Because they are Protestants, and Protestants are being attacked in Catholic France. And England, or really what we mean by that is England and Wales, and later Scotland and Ireland as well, or parts of Ireland, England has become Protestant after Henry VIII's Reformation, which is in 1535, roughly, give or take a bit of jiggery-pokery with things going on at different times, but we can say generally 1535. So as a result, England is seen as like a safe haven for Protestant migrants. Okay? And Protestants arrive, often with wealth, with lots of skills, lots of them were silk weavers, some were cobblers, cobblers means that they make shoes, or lots were watchmakers, watch and clock makers. And all sorts of other trades. But generally speaking, they're quite wealthy and they're, they're arriving with skills which England needs or wants or certainly doesn't have as much of. So that means they are very often very successful in England. They really flourish in certain parts of London, in Spitalfields or what is now Mile End in East London. They, they really flourish there. They're poorer areas because they don't, you know, always arrive with bags of money because they couldn't take it with them. But once they set themselves up, they become very, very successful in England. Um, you might remember we learnt about the Bank of England, didn't we, and how several of the first investors in the Bank of England were actually Huguenots, um, who sort of set it up, really. I think the first director was a Huguenot migrant as well. So they're very successful here. Um, and as a result, a kind of generally well respected and welcomed into government, working in government or local councils, things like that. But it does lead to some resentment and you often see um, a lot of 
satire. I'll explain that what that is in a second. Of um, Huguenot migrants as kind of as as very French. I'll explain what I mean by that in a second as well. Um, as very French or kind of um, a bit over the top um, or a bit kind of superior, almost thinking they're better than the English. And we looked at, you might remember, we looked at that um, uh, cartoon called Noon that you can um, go and look up in your spare time as well. What I mean by satire is basically taking the mick out of them, like making fun out of them. What I mean by very French, well, what that meant at the time was a bit kind of too fashionable, wearing men kind of wearing what might be described at the time as effeminate clothes, so like female, female like clothes, too much silk, too much decoration on them, big cuffs, big ruffs, that sort of thing. So not very English, they would say. So they're sort of, they have the mick taken out from them a bit, but it's all, it's all sort of tongue in cheek. There's nothing really aggressive towards the Huguenots. And actually, if we think about another group, and there are loads with early modern, thanks girls, thanks Shereen, there are loads with the early modern section that you might think about. For example, you might talk about go and revise handsome migrants as well, or go and revise about migrants from the rest of the world, people like John Blunk, for example. Um, but this leads us on quite nicely uh, gypsy migrants, another one to do, to the poor Palatines, because I think they're quite an interesting case. The poor Palatines arrive in the 1730s, but I'm going to try and get uh, exact dates. Hold on. Oh no, totally wrong. Poor, ta poor Palatines arrive in London in 1709. Okay. They were from Germany. And they were mostly poor farmers. That is actually quite important because um, the, the British were convinced that these poor Palatines, these German migrants who were arriving, at first they were convinced that they were all Protestants and therefore that they were going to be like the Huguenots. They were going to arrive with skills that England needed and money, and that was going to be great. So at first, the government, so we are here talking about official responses, support them. They provide um, like a city of tents on a, on a park called Blackheath, which is in East London. So a city of tents for them to live in. And they, they offer food and kind of financial support as well. So that's like an official response. One second, I'm getting there. And then unofficial responses. People, ordinary people, also raise money. to give to the Palatines. Yeah, exactly, a huge sum. Today's money, uh, about 100,000 odd, I would have thought, roughly, possibly a bit more. The poor Palatines, roughly 10,000 or so, roughly. Um, so it's, it's a significant amount of money. Um, but what the Brits quickly realise is that a lot of these poor Palatine migrants aren't Protestant at all. They're Catholics. And they, even those that are Protestant, are nothing like the Huguenots. They are farmers. England has a lot of farmers in 1709. They don't need any more farmers. And also, they're basically fleeing Germany because there's been really bad harvests there for a number of years. So also, these farmers are really poor. They're arriving destitute in poverty with virtually nothing. And England decides, well, we don't really want them because they're not Protestant, or lots of them aren't and they're not coming with skills or money that we're after. So, the government in 1709 deports 
about half of them, in total, I think it's about five or six thousand back to Germany. Um, then in 1710, the government send half, or sorry, send roughly 3,000 to America. Because actually that was why lots of the handsome, the poor Palatines came in the first place. They wanted to get to America, which then was large parts of it were a British colony, th the 13 colonies in America. Okay. And then the final few thousand kind of drift either back to Germany eventually or drift onto America themselves. So very, very quickly, actually, the government basically get rid of them because they decide they don't want them, because they aren't arriving with skills, they're not arriving with wealth, and they're farmers. And England has got plenty of those. All right. There's, so those are two for the early modern period. Again, I would go and look at Hansers as well. I'd go and look at migrants from the rest of the world. There are lots in the early modern period that you can talk about. Um, just conscious of time, as quick as possible, go through some industrial um, groups. Now, the big group that I would talk about in the industrial section is empire migration. The empire is expanding at this time. It is, it is especially expanding into... Canada, India, later in the industrial period into Africa as well, and of course the Caribbean. And that means that world trade is growing. There was a question last year in the migrants paper, how far has world trade led to migration in this period? Well, it's, that's really asking you about the empire and the growth of the empire. And with that trade, migrants are arriving. So you see migrants starting to arrive from all over the British Empire. Especially, we see Lascar sailors. These are sailors typically from India, who are arriving in ports like Liverpool, especially, and London, Glasgow as well, in Scotland. They're getting off the ships, and some of them are settling and even having families in Liverpool. Abdullah Qasim is one of the people that we looked at who was living in, in um, Liverpool in the 1860s, 1870s, but was from India. And they are working on the ships, all right? These aren't, they're not owning the ships, they're not traders, these are, are poorer migrants. We are, see a similar thing, sorry, I should have put China here as well. When we talk about China, though, we've got to be careful. It's cities, Shanghai, Hong Kong, for example, were the two big British colonies in China. Um, we see a similar thing with Chinese sailors, they especially settle in, um, in London, in Limehouse, which is an area in East London, okay? We see migrants coming from the Caribbean, and often these are people who are coming over as enslaved people, and they are then emancipated, they are freed. And we looked at loads of examples here, like Francis Barber was one or Ignatius Sancho. No, that's going to come later because Windrush happens in 1948, so it's out of these, out of these um, uh, time parameters. Uh, so essentially what I'm saying is if they ask you about anything to do with expansion of countries, expansion of colonies, expansion of empire, that is asking about empire migration. And then it would be quite simple, actually, to construct a good paragraph on that. You just talk about, well, look at all these people who are coming from all these places simply because Britain has an empire there. Um, there's a really good historian called Peter, in fact, it's not Peter Fryer who says this. It's another historian whose name evades me. But when talking about modern migration and why there are so many people in Britain now from India and the Caribbean, etc., he says, well, we are here because you were there. Britain had an empire, therefore these people migrated to the British Isles. Okay? Um, the obvious other one, actually, that we spoke about a lot here is Dido Elizabeth Bal Lindsay. And you remember, she's the, the woman who grows up 
as an, um, an aristocrat and has a really interesting but perhaps not very typical story of migration in the Joshua period. Yes, go on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she would fit into this as well. Uh, although I think that fits into just fits into early modern because I think it's in the 1740s. But you can actually talk about empire migration in both because the empire's grown at this time as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. The other group we the, again, there's loads that we can talk about here. Um, but the other group I think it would be quite good to talk about because there's lots on them is Jewish migrants in the industrial period. So you first of all, Daniel, jack it off for us, and then just come and take one of these. Daniel, just come and take one of those. Uh, because you have, oh sorry, Jews are being attacked. Thanks, boys. Thanks, boys. In Russia. And so that leads to Jews coming to Britain, especially London. So they're coming because they're being attacked in Russia. They are also coming for work. And you might remember that um, Jews start to set up sweatshops in, the, in East London. Sweatshops which are um, making clothes from rags or fixing um, old clothes. You might remember we watched that video, didn't we, of them kind of putting cardboard over shoes that had holes in the sole and painting the soles black and then reselling them. And you might also remember that this caused lots of resentment from tailors in London because they were really annoyed that they were taking um, uh, all their work. Thanks, girls. They're really annoyed they're taking loads of work from them and also like selling really bad quality clothes, giving tailors a bad name. So those Jewish migrants fl flocking to London actually causes quite a lot of resentment, although lots of them are very successful. And most famously, of course, in um, the 1890s, Jews are blamed for the Jack the Ripper murders. Um, several Jewish men are accused of being the murderer, and there's a strong chance that, that, a, that the man who was the murderer, they think now, actually was Jewish. So maybe, you know, there's an element of fairness there. But they were more typically kind of accused of being Jack the Ripper because they're a target for people. They're still seen as semi-criminal. You um, might remember in year seven or year eight, you studied Oliver. Fagan is meant to be Jewish. Um, this man who's leading this ring of pickpockets. You might also, we're not going to have time today because we're going to run out of time and I want to do some on modern, but you might also go and read about Jewish migrants across Britain. Lots of them went, as, went and worked as travelling peddlers, walking huge distances across Britain, selling old rags. So you might go and look up about that as well. But let's do a little bit on modern migration. Um, before 1948, and we are going to see that date, 1948, because that's really important. Before 1948, some ones for you to go and revise on your own, because we're going to run out of time shortly. I'd go and look at Belgian refugees who are arriving in World War I. I'd go and look at Jewish refugees in World War II. Kinder transport, etc. is going to come into that as well. But the big thing I want to focus on is 1948. Because before 1948, you're going to refer to anyone coming from the empire as an empire migrant. After 1948, you and in the exam, they will refer to them as Commonwealth migrants. Okay? Why? Because in 1948, a new law was passed. It's called the Commonwealth Citizenship Act, which made all migrants from the empire 
which was becoming this new thing, the Commonwealth, which those colonies which had, had left the British Empire could choose to join, it's like a club, um, which gave all migrants from the Commonwealth British passports. So migrants from the Commonwealth get British passports. And that leads to a huge influx of, um, of migrants to Britain, especially to, or especially from, uh, leads to migration from India, the Caribbean, and Africa, places like Nigeria, Uganda, especially, okay? I'd go and research or go and revise a couple of points within that, within the story of Commonwealth migrants and how they're treated. So I'd go and look up the um, Notting Hill riots. and carnival. The first thing I'd go and do some revision about, because that's part of that story. I'd go and look up the laws that are passed. So like, this is unofficial, this is an official response, right? Such as you might look up the Immigration Act, or Immigration Acts, there are several. So there are lots of new laws that are passed specifically relating to Commonwealth migrants actually trying to stop them coming to the UK. And I'd also go and look up how this leads to resentment towards Commonwealth migrants. So I'd go and look up Enoch Powell and um, the Rivers of Blood speech. Which is in 1968. And then I'd also go and look up what this leads to. He becomes like a mouthpiece for right-wing anti-migration, actually, you might argue, fascist groups like the National Front and the BNP, the British National Party. Which today is, you might argue, sort of morphed more recently into things like UKIP or certainly lots of BMP supporters are also UKIP supporters. Um, but also you might talk about the counter movements which developed to fight against these groups. So like uh, the uh, anti-fascist alliance. Okay. So really what we're talking about here is a long narrative of Commonwealth migration, but also, right, well, what does that lead to in Britain? Well, it leads to resentment from some people. And we talk about a small minority of people. In 1979, somebody from the National Front stood in a national election to try and become an MP. A hundred and, or several people did actually, actually. About hun roughly 191,000 people voted for the, the National Front in 1979. That's out of 37 million people who could vote in the UK. So about 0.5% of British people who could vote voted for the National Front in 1979. So we're talking about a really small group of people who were really aggressively anti-migration, borderline fascist. Fascist is like the Nazis were fascist. Um, I'm not saying the National Front are Nazis, but you could argue they were fascist. Um, they are a small, small minority of people, 0.5%, but they are really vocal. They are really loud, and they shout about their abhorrent views very, very loudly from the rooftops. Okay? So we have to talk about both integration of Commonwealth migrants, because they do become integrated. For example, a 2014 report that showed that mixed-race um, children are hugely on the rise in the UK, um, that Caribbean culture is obviously a huge part of our culture. Notting Hill Carnival is the largest street party in Europe and the second largest in the world behind Rio de Janeiro. So there have been great successes on integration of Commonwealth migrants, but we still have this problem, don't we, of anti-migration. And of course we see that with Brexit in 2016. 
So go and also do EU migration. I'd go and revise that as well because that's the one thing we haven't spoken about here. But that, in a nutshell, is it. Good luck in your exam. Um,